Dr. Larry Marshall is the Chief Executive of the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, Australia's CSIRO. Over the past eight years, Larry has transformed the nation's science headquarters into a thriving innovation hub. He leaves the post in June 2023 to take on a new challenge, connecting Australian universities to big business. Welcome, Dr. Larry Marshall. Your time at Macquarie was longer than most. You did both your undergraduate and your postgrad there. Oh, it was a fantastic experience. Um, I went to Macquarie, I think the first year they had a science degree. And so it was still kind of set up to be a little bit more art focused, which means Macquarie focused on the human um, more than the score. And that meant you got a very different experience, different types of professors, different type of teaching, and a very different diversity of people. The trees, the campus, the big courtyard, the hillside. Um, I, I remember um, uh, um, on, on a bet driving my car around Dyer Yabri's um, amphitheater, trying to show that it could, that the um, centrifugal force would hold me up, which it did, till we hit a bog and then got stuck. Um, that was a bit embarrassing. Um, <laughs> Now, you met up with your professor, Jim Piper, there as well. When you go to the open days um, at each year and as you progress to do, decide for an honours year or a PhD, um, you, you meet all the professors and they've lectured you sometimes. And he was just, he was so engaging as a, as a professor. Jim also um, really understood how important it was for our science to actually make an impact on the world. I'll never forget going into the lab. So he'd, he'd done a postdoc at Oxford and he'd shipped all these lasers from Oxford, these big old copper vapor lasers and gas lasers all the way from Oxford to Australia so that he could get a running start on starting his research group here. And yeah, that, it was that sort of almost entrepreneurial as a professor approach to, you know, having an impact on the world um, and getting the students excited about um, about what we could do with with, a, with our science and in particular with lasers. You invented the human-friendly laser. How did you do that? So iSafe lasers um, really use an attribute of the eye, the ocular fluid, a particular wavelength that gets absorbed so that you can use thousands of times more power. And I wouldn't necessarily say I'm the father of that, but I definitely invented the iSafe laser and that enabled lasers to be more widely used safely without hurting people. If this is your eyeball and, and this is your retina, the ocular fluid is the fluid in your eyeball. So the light comes in from a laser through the lens of your eye and it gets focused onto the retina. If the laser is powerful, you'll burn a hole in the retina and, and it, it doesn't need a huge amount of power to do that. So the trick was figuring out a wavelength that would be really strongly absorbed in the eye, and that's 1.54 microns. There was no laser at that time that could produce that. So I invented this thing called an optical parametric oscillator that took a regular common YAG laser, very common laser, and shifted its wavelength into that eye safe band, and it did it really efficiently, like about 70%, which is for lasers, lasers are usually about 1% efficient. So this was crazy efficient. And that meant it could really, you could take lasers that were already out there in the field and really quickly convert them to this iSafe feature, which meant, which meant you could use them for things like, you know, um, supermarket scanners or um, uh, obstacle avoidance for aircraft or laser radar, which of course now is what's on autonomous vehicles. Right, and submarines, I do believe. So <laughs> and that was another area that you had a big hand in. Tell me about that. Dealing with eyes really is fascinating and that's what led me to the green laser um, because green um, can pass through the ocular fluid and can really efficiently burn the retina. So it sounds a bit dangerous, but actually diabetics usually go blind at some point in their life because um, the, the blood retina barrier um, is really sensitive to the glucose level in, their, in, in your blood. So, so diabetes will often um, lead to blindness. The way to cure that, believe it or not, is to deliberately burn the periphery of the retina with a laser. And that pretty much stops the disease. Um, so that's a great example of, of you know, 
using a laser to do something. It's very, very hard to do any other way. The technique itself um, came from World War II. Um, soldiers who had flash burns, um, who happened to have diabetes, didn't go blind. And those that didn't have the flash burns did. And so scientists figured out a long time ago that you could that, that you could burn the burn the retina. Um, the trick was coming up with um, a green laser that was small, compact, reliable. And what we did that was sort of magical, you could do things that traditional lasers couldn't do, and that made the treatment far far better, um, less even less invasive, more reliable, more, more consistent, more controlled. But the green laser led to the submarine work as well, because then in water, there are two wavelengths that penetrate really deeply into water. Um, not surprisingly, green and blue, <laughs> basically. And I, I did two types of lasers, a green one that went on a submarine to scan the ocean floor, so you could actually find things. And it's, it's fascinating because uh, man-made objects reflect laser light differently to natural objects. Um, the man-made objects preserve polarization, and so you can find things um, that are man-made really effectively with a laser scanner. The other one I did was a blue laser, which goes in a satellite, um, and it can scan the ocean from space, which is really interesting. This is national security stuff. Is that how that technology is applied? Sometimes, yeah. So sometimes it's used so satellites can communicate with submarines. Thing I was really interested in um, for monitoring things like the Great Barrier Reef, if you can scan a large area with a laser, you can get a lot of surface data information, like um, ocean temperature, uh, acidity, um, plankton content from scattering. So I was always intrigued with the ability to use the laser, not just for communications, but actually for environment. And is it being applied in that way? So yes, it was used that way. Um, and it kind of was a predecessor to what um, NASA do now without needing lasers. But the, it, it's interesting, it's always the way with technology. Um, you, you do something with the technology that's available at, at the day and that kind of gives you the foundation to do the next thing. A lot of that laser scattering work helped NASA scientists understand the characteristics of those things optically and then they enable, that enable them to figure out how to do the same imaging without an active source, without a laser, just using sunlight and then the reflected spectrum. A lot of this work was done in the US. Uh, you went to Stanford. Yeah, so I really lucked out there. And Bob Beyer, who was the Dean of Research at Stanford, came to speak at the 1988 um, Physics Bicentenary here in Sydney. And afterwards, he wanted to go surfing. Mm. So a few of us <laughs> took him surfing. I love to surf. Um, and Bob's a keen surfer. And Jim, this is why Jim was so good. He, he knew all these people around the world and he used to find ways to get us to these conferences where we could present our work. And, you know, when you're presenting at it, it's a bit scary going and presenting at a big US conference, but it, you realize that actually our science is just as good as theirs. And after a few times doing that, you kind of, you lose your, you lose your Aussie inferiority <laughs> complex and you feel like, okay, we really are playing at a, at a global level. And so the combination of taking Bob surfing and presenting at these conferences he said, you know, I was finishing up my PhD. He said, you know, we've got some gear at the Ginston Lab that would really help you figure this out and some people. So I got to spend um, the best part of a year there. Um, I'll never forget, I got this great photo of Art Charlo, the, you know, the, one of the inventors of the laser. We're sitting at his desk and he's explaining to me, he, he's looking at my results for my PhD and he's explaining this concept to me, which is great. And then Bob offered me a postdoc at Stanford, Colin Webb, who was Jim's PhD advisor, offered me a postdoc at Oxford. So I had a really hard choice um, between the two. And then Jim Collins, who later became famous writing the book Good to Great, he was at the business school. Jim said, Larry, have you ever thought about starting a company? And I should say in that time at Stanford, um, I met Jim through Bob and Jim said, you know, since you're here, why don't you just come and sit in on some business classes? And so for me, being exposed to that, I never heard that I could do business before. And so in a way, Bob, Jim and, 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 um, and Jim Collins kind of helped me, th expose me to that. And then most people go to Stanford already with the idea of I'm going to learn how to start a company here. I didn't, didn't go with <laughs> that That idea. wasn't your plan. Yeah. <laughs> You went on to do, you were there in the US for 26 years. You did six startups 
and you've got 20 patents registered. So business was your thing. Entrepreneurship was your thing. Yeah, it, it always started with science. What then brought you back to Australia? Once I did my first company, it was really eye-opening. Um, and I realised how much amazing science we have in Australia and how rarely we create a big company with it. We're, we're brilliant inventors, but we struggle to turn that invention into a company that employs people. And we really need that to grow our, to grow our country, to grow our, our economy. So I started working on it from the valley, chipping away, chipping away on this innovation problem. I started a venture fund. Um, it's the first Aussie venture fund to operate out of Silicon Valley, and it would only invest in Australian companies that came from science. So we're trying to help them find money. Unfortunately, um, the ones that were successful moved to the US. So, so we, in a way, we exacerbated the problem. We kind of helped it, but we also made it worse. So then I started thinking about, if you think about innovation ecosystems, um, there's always some kind of foundational company like Intel or Hewlett Packard that uses science to create a market that couldn't exist without science solving some unsolvable, insolvable problem. That got me thinking about CSIRO. One of my partners sent me an email with the job ad and with a kind of a snide comment, like, you know, who'd want to work there? Like it was sort of, you know, anyone looking for a job, ha ha ha, you know. And I th thought, this is the National Science Agency. We should be, we should be celebrating it, not criticizing it. And so that was, yeah, it was sort of started the whole thought process. So in the end, I, I, um, I called the recruiter and then, and then he called me back a couple of weeks later and said, let's do an interview. So I did. Um, and he said, so innovation catalyst, you know, and like bridge from lab. I go, I, thought, well, I didn't like that idea. So they talked with the board. And then I did a phone call with Simon McKeon, who was the chair. And Simon said, yeah, look, it'd be good to have you come down, but we're not recruiting internationally, so you have to pay your airfare and all the rest of it. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, and, and okay, so you're that serious. All right, okay, I guess we will interview you. It was an interesting journey. I haven't applied for a job since I left uni, so it was a funny thing to do. And I was so impressed at Simon as the chair, um, being able to recognise what the organisation needed. What I was proposing was, it, it sounds obvious now because it's been so successful, but at the time, innovation, like Syro innovation, people laughed. <laughs> I mean, they really did, you know. So he was quite visionary to kind of, it somehow resonated with him, he could see it. Well, now that you're here, what are the big, what are the big questions for you? What, what do you want to do? So look, the first five years was about making the innovation catalyst sort of dream come true. And, you know, we, we worked with over 500 teams from all 39 universities to help them um, commercialize their, their, their ideas. The first three successful um, founders out of that were, 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 were female scientists who normally wouldn't have fit the quote typical CEO model, um, but they've all done great. Um, and it, it, that told us something about the nature of innovation for scientists. I mean, we're different. It's a very different, more inclusive approach to leadership. Female scientists in particular really flourished in that environment. It made me realize that Diversity is actually the reason that that worked. It not it wasn't the outcome. It was the it it was the secret sauce that made it work, and it was not what we expected when we started. Um, so then the other thing was um, uh, how do we make the organisation more sustainable? Because Syro had been shrinking for 25 years. I'll never forget the week I started. I got an email from the friends of Syro. It's a you know Twitter group or whatever. And they sent me this chart with the decline. And basically, what are you going to do? Are you going to, what's you yours going to look this? like? Yeah. yeah. So, so our, our, our chart goes up. Um, it's the first growth the organization's seen consistently in, in three decades because the organization changed, you know, right? Became more inclusive, more open, less siloed, more wanting to collaborate in the university sector and more focused on what can my science do to solve real problems for the nation? And that was where we came up with the the Syro six, the six national challenges. Um, you know, um, so f food and food and agriculture. How are we going to feed 10 billion people, particularly from Australia, where we're going to need to grow twice the crops with half the water because of climate change? Um, energy. 
how are we going to go to net zero without derailing our economy? Um, environment, security, how do we protect the country from both pandemics um, and um, cyber threats? So real viruses and, and, and digital ones. Um, and that really, that one actually was one of the main reasons that we we're on the front foot with COVID-19. Um, and then future industries, you know, we, we know that a third of our economy and more than that of our tax base comes from fossil related exports. We know that they're going to go away. So what do we replace them with? And, and, and our thesis was science could create that whole economic pillar that, you know, fast forward a decade or two, science is the third of the economy. Pillar generated by knowledge, by science, you're not digging it up out of the ground, you, you're creating it. So it's a wellspring that just keeps keeps going. You know, it doesn't run out. So the really big one for us at the moment is missions, national missions. And I think this is the thing, if we can get the universities working on the cutting edge research there, us helping them translate that into the real world solutions, and then industry taking that up and government being willing to support all that. If we can get um, the system buying into that, then I think Australia will navigate through the disruption that we've got at the moment really well. Do you have any personal mission here? Like, is there one that is at your own personal mission? Yeah. Yeah, no, very much so. So the, the innovation dilemma has been my obsession for 30 years now. How do we, how do we solve, change this mindset that somehow scientists can't run a company, right? Because in, in business, in the system here, yeah, scientists can't run a company. Like I, so we leave and we go overseas. Um, but if we can change that so that actually, you know, we want scientists to run companies. If scientists are able to run companies and encouraged to do so, they won't leave and they'll build them here and we'll grow that economic pillar that we really, really desperately need for our future. So that's my personal, personal mission, to make that happen. Thank you so very much, Dr. Larry Marshall, for being with us today. Well, it's a real pleasure and thank you for coming.